Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Before we hear tonight's file... I have a special request for our boy and girl listeners. If your dad or mother is not near the radio now, please tell them that in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has an important announcement about home mortgages. Yes, the Equitable Society is going to give full details on their assured home ownership plan. It's a money saver, a worry saver, a home saver. So, will you do that, boys and girls? Tell Dad and Mother to listen 14 minutes from now for the important information on the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. Tonight's FBI file, The Big Guy. History has a way of repeating itself, of forming a pattern which recurs at almost regular intervals. For that reason, anyone studying the field of crime today must go back and study the happenings after World War I. There began a rising tide of crime with the coming of peace in 1918, even as there is a rising crime wave today. Criminals banded together and formed what used to be called gangs. The men were identified by the now almost outworded gangsters. But if the word is outmoded, the methods of operation are not. And today, one of the biggest problems facing every law enforcement agency like your FBI is the potential return of the mobs. The crime wave can be fought, and fought successfully if the formation of new interlocking groups of criminals can be prevented. Once the ranks are formed, Fighting the war against criminals is more difficult because arresting an underling does not impair the effectiveness of the mob, does not destroy the leader, the man on top. Tonight's file opens in a small apartment in the midtown section of a large eastern city. A short, stubby man is removing his shirt as he talks to a newly arrived visitor. Sorry you had to wait for me, Charlie. I had to go down to the drugstore to get this stuff. What is it? It's for mosquito bites. I'm covered with them. Yeah, I can see them. You, you want to rub some of the stuff on my back, Charlie? Sure. Oh, I hope it works. This itch is driving me crazy. How's that feel? Oh, great. Uh, get some on my neck, will you? Okay. How'd the trip go? Well, can't you see the condition I'm in? What a trip. Brother, that's the last time I leave this town. Here. A little right yeah, yeah, here? Yeah, yeah, right there. The first thing is the train. It's old, it's hot, and it's dirty. Hmm. 
Then to make it worse, I draw an old guy sitting next to me who beefs to the conductor when I light a cigar. Can't smoke all the way up. Oh, fine. Then I get up there, walk three miles to the river. I find a spot behind some weeds in a little clearing. Mm-hmm. For three and a half hours, I wait, just sitting there. I was chewed by mosquitoes, bees, and every other bug in the book. Yeah. I guess that does it. Oh. <sighs> Thanks. Lou show up? Yeah, finally. What happened? Came down the river in a canoe. When he was maybe 15 feet away, I let go with both barrels. He's dead? Natch. I'll tell George. He'll be glad Mr. Lou Dillon is out of the way. Look, when you see George, tell him any time he wants somebody else knocked off, he should please make it indoors. Next morning at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is standing in front of the teletype machines reading an incoming message when Agent Don Conway approaches. Jim. Hmm? Oh, hello, Don. Oh. I didn't hear you come up. There's a girl named Ann Whitman waiting for you at your desk. Did you talk to her? No, she said she wanted to see you. I called her the other day about Lou Dillon. He's the fellow who violated his federal parole. Oh. She's his girl. Did she know where Dillon was? No, not specifically. She said that he'd gone hunting someplace upstate. How long ago? Last week. She said she'd get in touch with us if she heard from him. Maybe she has some information now. Hmm, could be. Come on. Uh, Dylan's the man who was sent away for being a lookout on a bank robbery, isn't he? Yeah, that's right. It was his first conviction, and from what he said, his first crime. Yeah. You made the arrest, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. I thought at the time that Dylan was a nice young fellow who had gone wrong because of circumstances. I remember your report. He had a good record in prison. Still and all, after his good record, he's run away. Oh, Don, you'd better stick around while I talk to Miss Whitman, huh? Okay. Miss Whitman, sorry to keep you waiting. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Taylor. That's Mr. Conway. We met unofficially a few minutes ago. Oh, yes, hello. Have you heard from Lou Dillon, Miss Whitman? No, sir. But I had a call about an hour ago from the chief of police of a town upstate named Centerville. What did he want? Well, he... He said that one of his men found a canoe in an upstate park. There was a hole in the bottom of it that looked like a shotgun hole. They identified the canoe as one that Lou had been using on his hunting trip. And was there any trace of Dillon? No, sir. They... They're afraid something's happened. Something serious. Well, how did the police happen to call you? Well, they said Lou was staying at a lodge, and, and when he was reported missing, they went there and looked through his papers. They found my name on a letter. I, I thought you told me you didn't know where Dylan went. Well, this wasn't a letter I wrote to him, Mr. Taylor. This was one he was going to send to me. Oh, oh, I see. I'm sorry. Do you think that, that something serious has happened to him, Mr. Taylor? Well, Miss Whitman, that's difficult to judge. Tell me, do you, do you know of any enemies he had? Anyone who might want to harm him? Well, no. I... It might be one of the men he was in prison with, Jim. Uh, that's possible, Don. Miss Whitman, did the police tell you where the canoe was found? Yes, I think they said... Franklin National Park. If they did, then that's our case, Jim. That's right. Don, I think we'd better start investigation on this right away. Yes? Mr. Blair to see you. Uh, send him right in. Yes, sir. Oh, and Miss Williams, hold all calls for the next ten minutes. I don't want to be disturbed. Yes, sir. Hi, Mr. Medford. Oh, come in, Charlie. Okay. Well, glad to see you back. Oh, thanks. It's good to be back, Charlie. How was the trip? Very tiring. I covered ten cities in ten days. Hey, did you do any good? Well, some things were accomplished, but they didn't come easy. You know, Charlie, I wish that some of the people who think that criminal activities are a soft touch could work alongside of me for a week. I think that they'd have found out that those of us who deal in larceny have to work twice as hard for our illicit dollars. Hmm. You can say that again. I've been tempted many times myself to turn legit. Yeah. Freddy, get back? Yeah, he came in yesterday, covered with mosquito bites. Hmm. <laughs> he was really steamed about being sent to the country. Was he successful? Oh, yeah. Everything went fine. I'm almost sorry to hear that. Yeah. Well, you're the one who wanted Lou Dillon knocked off. Yes, yes, I know. But I was rather fond of that young man. Then why did you want to see him get it? For business reasons. He could have gotten us in trouble. How? Well, when he was released from prison, he decided to go straight. That made him too big a risk. He knew too much about us. Oh. 
Didn't I hear that he planned to get married? Yeah, next month. Uh, probably be quite a blow to the girl. Do you know her, Charlie? No. Freddie does. Hmm. Well, have Freddie pay a call on her and, you know, bring her some cash. That might make things a bit easier. Okay. Oh, and uh, tell Freddie that he's got a bonus coming for killing Dylan. A bonus? Yeah. Two weeks in the country. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, that's a slow train from Centerville. I know. Did you see the chief of police? Yes, by the time I got there, he had already had part of the river dragged. Find anything? Well, no trace of Dillon's body, if that's what you mean. How about anything else? Well, they found Dillon's rifle, and it hadn't been fired. Well, that removes any question of suicide. Well, we knew before we found the rifle that it wasn't suicide, Don. How? Well, the canoe was found downstream. So? An examination of it showed that the blast which ripped a hole through it had been fired from the outside. It still could have been an accident. Oh, this wasn't any accident, Don. Well, how do you know? Well, we've got evidence. Along the bank of the river, at approximately the same place Dillon's gun was picked up, there were indications that someone may have been lying in wait for him. There was a small area of beaten down grass where someone had been sitting, and sitting quite a long time, too. There were 17 cigarette butts strewn around. We also found footprints leading to this spot and away from it. I hope they were good enough for impressions. Yes, yes, they were. The lab ought to be able to give us some help on this one. Well, I sent in the cigarette butts and the footprint data on the way up here. Any idea when we'll get a report? Well, we went right to work on it. Jim, does Lou Dillon's girl know about these latest developments? Yes, I notified her. You know, this case started out to be a simple federal parole violation, Don. Yeah. And the way it looks now, it's murder. <laughs> Just a moment. Hello, Ann. Oh, hello, Fred. Uh, can I come in? Yes, come ahead. I, uh, I hope you don't mind my dropping by like this. Why, no. I had a reason for coming. I just don't know how to say it, I guess. About Lou, you mean? Yeah, I just heard about it. It's real tough, Ann. Lou was a great little guy. Fred, please don't say what. There's still hope that he'll be found. Oh, sure, sure. What I meant was, well, everybody liked the guy. I know. You and him were, I mean, uh, planning to get married, right? Yes. Well, uh, I got something for you. It's sort of like a wedding present, I guess. Uh, here, you, you take it, Ann. Fred, what is this? You take it. But I... Honey, it's dough, a real nice bundle of dough. What? Well, here, look. What? I don't understand. Fred, why should you give I me ain't a... giving it to you. It's from a guy me and Lou both have worked for. Who is he? Well, he don't want his name brought in. Uh, just compliments of a friend. Fred, I can't take this. Huh? I sound ungrateful, I know, and I'm sure the man means well, but I can't possibly accept it. Honey, that's 500 bucks. Just take it back, Fred, and tell the man thanks. Well, okay. And thanks to you, too, for stopping by. Oh, don't mention it. I'll be seeing you, honey. Get back in, sir. Huh? You heard me. No. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI protects American citizens in American homes. Now a word about another type of home protection. Protection against mortgage foreclosure. A plan which not only safeguards the homeowner during his lifetime, but also continues to protect his widow if he should die. Here is what happens. It's the Equitable Society representative holding an envelope in his hand. He says, Good morning, Mrs. Rogers. I thought I'd bring these over personally. Here's the canceled mortgage on your home, all paid up. And here's a check from the Equitable Society. It covers all the payments your husband made to reduce the principal of the mortgage during his lifetime. Sounds almost too good to be true, doesn't it? But this is exactly what happens in the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, which combines a low-cost first mortgage with special life insurance protection. Under this plan, 
the widow doesn't inherit a mortgage. She inherits a home that's hers free and clear. What's more, every dollar previously paid under the plan to reduce the mortgage is returned to her. If the plan has been in operation for a number of years, this payment will amount to a very considerable sum of money. In addition, this equitable plan protects the home against another great hazard, hard times. The Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan accomplishes this through a special cash fund which is built up during the owner's lifetime. This fund is always ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. As the mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. For example, it can be used to pay off a 20-year mortgage in approximately 15 years. Last but not least, the mortgage interest is only 4%, and there's a liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. So, all in all, a man is very fortunate if his health, age, income, home, and its location qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. The way to find out if you qualify is to get in touch with your Equitable Society representative. Look in the phone book or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That, that's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to tonight's FBI file, The Big Guy. One of the many shocking things about the tremendous segment of our population confined in the prisons of the nation is that more than 50% of those persons are in prison for at least the second time. Some of them have been returned more than a dozen times. Somewhere there is an answer to why there is more than an even chance that anyone who is sentenced to prison for the first time will ultimately be returned to prison after his release. Possibly part of the answer lies in the fact that the public will not accept an ex-convict into its midst. There are many firms which will not hire a man who has done time. There are some communities which will not allow him to live within their confines. Not every ex-convict wants to lead a perfectly law-abiding life after his release from prison. Some of them are bitter at their treatment by society and want only to inflict revenge. But there are some who honestly want to lead a normal, useful life and to forget the past. It is our duty, the duty of every one of us, to make those men welcome in our ranks and to give them a chance to prove themselves useful members of society. Tonight's file continues at the apartment of Ann Whitman. Lou. Oh, Luke, darling, this is so wonderful. I just can't believe it. I, I can't believe you really. I'm here, honey. Lou, everybody <laughs> thought you were dead. Lou, where were you? What happened? It's kind of a long story. Look, I know you two want to be alone. I've now, wait a minute. I want you to hear the story, too. But, but I have to get back Sit to... down. Listen. Okay. What did you hear about me, Ann? What story did you get? Well... Your canoe was found, and there was a shotgun hole in it. The local police reported you missing. Uh Uh-huh. And then the FBI investigated. They found evidence that someone was waiting for you, that it wasn't an accident, that someone had shot and killed you. They were right, Anne. All but the part about being killed. Someone did shoot you? Yeah. Who? You want to answer that, Freddy? Huh? Do you want to tell her who shot me? How would I know? I saw you through the weeds, just before you pulled the trigger. Me? Uh-huh. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Come on, Lou. I see it. <laughs> Did you pick up his gun, honey? Yes, sure. You got anything we can use to tie him up? Well, I don't have any rope. Can I use that extension cord? Oh, sure. I want to be sure we keep him here after he comes to. Lou, did Freddy really try to kill you? Yeah. But why? You were friends. He was just taking orders. From who? The big guy. Who's he? The guy I used to work for. But why should he I'm to... playing it straight, honey. I guess the big guy didn't like that. So he tried to take care of me. How awful. He almost did it, too. What did happen, Lou? Well, I saw Fred just as he was going to shoot, and I ducked away a little. 
Only got hit in the shoulder. Oh. The canoe went over, and I went underwater and came up some distance downstream. I guess Fred figured he'd really finish me. Well, why didn't you go back to your lodge? I knew they'd come after me again. I went to a cabin downstream. An old trapper lived in it. He took care of me until I felt well enough to leave. <coughs> there, that ought to hold him. You better keep that gun on him anyway, though, just in case. Lou, where are you going? I got a call to make. To the police? No, not yet. I've got to see the big guy first. When I see the police, I want him to be with me. <laughs> Special Agent Conway speaking. Hello, Don. Oh, Jim, where are you? I'm up in Centerville. I've got some good news, Don. Yeah. Lou Dillon is still alive. What? How do you know? I just interviewed an old trapper who has a cabin about five miles downstream from where the accident occurred. He said that Dillon stayed with him after he'd been shot. Well, why didn't he notify the police? Well, Dillon asked him not to. He claimed it was just a hunting accident. Where's Dillon now? He left there earlier today. Any idea where he's headed? The trapper believes he said something about going to see his girl. Oh, this was early today? That's right. Well, if that's his destination, he should be at her place by now. Just about. Oh, Don, has anything come in from the lab yet? They just called. They'll have all the information for us in about an hour. Good. Now, look, I'm flying Don. I'll go right to Miss Whitman's from the airport. I'll meet you there. <laughs> Just a minute. Oh, hello, Mr. Taylor. Come in. Thanks. Mr. Conway just got here. He's with Fred Hall. Fred Hall? Hello, Jim. Oh, hi, Don. This is Fred Hall, Jim. And according to Miss Whitman, Hall is the one who shot Dylan. Lou got here just in time to catch him and tie him up. I see. And where is Dylan? Miss Whitman said he went to see someone called the big guy. Hmm? He believes he's the person who ordered Hall to shoot him. Who is the big guy, Hall? I don't know what she's talking about. You don't know anybody called the big guy? Never heard of him. Lou said he wanted to get him and bring him into the police. Well, that was foolish. Don, let's take Hall down to the office. We'll question him there. Mr. Medford. Lou. Lou Dillon. That's right. I didn't bother to announce myself. Do you mind? Well, where did you come from? I thought... I know. You thought I was dead. I'm afraid Fred gave you a bum steer. Fred? Well, what do you mean? Ah, oh, look, don't go into any act. I know the whole deal. Lou, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Fred Hall tried to kill me, Mr. Medford, and you ordered the job. I know this because I just left Fred. But, but I haven't seen Fred Hall in six months, Lou. Suppose you tell that to the cops, huh? Cops? That's what I came here for, to bring you to headquarters. Uh, Lou, look, I, I honestly don't know what this is all about. Obviously, you're under a strain of some sort. It appears to have stimulated your imagination. <laughs> now, look, now, why don't you be a good boy and go home and get some rest? I'm huh? not leaving here without you. That's what you think, kid. Huh? Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Hall, the last time you were arrested, you were picked up with a man named Charlie Blair. Is Blair the big guy? I don't know anybody by that name. Don, I think we've got some ammunition now to use on Mr. Hall. Did you get something in the lab? Yes. Paul, listen to this report. It should interest you. Item one. There were 17 cigarette butts found in one spot on the bank of the river where Dillon was shot. What's that got to do with me? Well, the laboratory says that the person who smoked those cigarettes has type AB blood. They determined this by analyzing the saliva. The blood test you took a little while ago showed your type matches this. What does that prove? AB is a reasonably rare type of blood. Still don't prove I shot Dillon, does it? No, no, it doesn't. Item two, the lab states that footprints found at this ambush were made by a man approximately five feet eight inches tall, weighing about 170 pounds. You get that kind of stuff from a footprint? That's right. Once the laboratory knows how long a stride that person takes and how deep his footprint went. 
That still don't prove I did it. Granted. Item three. Item three was a sample of ground at the scene of the crime. This was analyzed by the lab. From it, they could tell you were there. How? Oh. Recognize these shoes, huh? Yeah, they're mine. Where'd you get them? We got a search warrant. We found them in your apartment. Have they been to the lab yet, Jim? Yes. And the report shows that the sample of earth I brought in matches the mud on these shoes. So what? A lot of guys have shoes with mud on them. Not that mud, Hall. There isn't another place in the country where you'd find dirt of this exact composition. I'd say that report proves that you were by the river. Oh, we've got enough here to have a federal attorney get a conviction. An attempted murder is the same as actual murder. Now, do you want to take this all alone? Do you want to go to jail for life? Do you want to let the man who gave you the orders go free? Start talking. <laughs> He's out, Mr. Medford. Real cold. Good. What are we going to do with him? <laughs> That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah. And this time you'd better take care of him yourself. Okay. But not in here. It's too messy. How about the garage? Well, I'd just as soon he didn't turn up for a while, Charlie. Suppose I drop him in the river. Fine. Shall I move him now? Yes, take him away. I've got some work to finish. Okay. <clears throat> Use your freight elevator, huh? Yes. It's kind of heavy. Would you open the door? Oh, sure. Put him down, Blair. What? What? Go ahead, it... Jim. I've got them both covered. Who are you? We're special agents of the FBI, Mitford. We came here for you and Blair. Dylan's unconscious, Jim, but still breathing. That's good, but it still doesn't change the charge. You two are still being arrested for attempted murder. <laughs> Charles Blair, George Medford, and Fred Hall were tried in a federal court for attempted murder on government reservation. All three men were sentenced to life imprisonment. And thus, a vicious machine of crime and corruption was broken up by your FBI. It is true that two special agents made the actual arrests in tonight's case. But the evidence from which the convictions were obtained came from the laboratory of your FBI, the laboratory which serves as the unsung hero in a great percentage of cases. As recently as 1932, there was one man in the FBI lab, and he had one microscope with which to work. Today, there are more than 300 trained scientists who examine evidence, who last year examined more than 104,000 pieces of evidence. Those reports helped your FBI to prove the guilt of a great many criminals and thus helped the Federal Bureau of Investigation protect its employer, you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Friends, if you were impressed a few minutes ago by what I told you about the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, if the idea appeals to you of a low-interest-rate first mortgage combined with life insurance to protect your home against death and hard times, then I suggest that you get in touch with your Equitable representative soon. He'll show you exactly what this plan will do for you personally, how much money it can save you, how much added security it will give you. So contact your Equitable Society representative without delay or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> Next week, we will dramatize another exciting case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The dramatic story of a manhunt through a flaming forest. Its subject, a prison break. Its title, The Curious Prospectors. 
The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Curious Prospectors on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. If you are a homeowner or a prospective home buyer, tonight may be an important night. Tonight, the Equitable Society has an interesting message for you about America's finest plan for home ownership, the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan. This is one of the Equitable Society's most worthwhile services, a money-saving, home-saving plan, because it combines a low-interest-rate mortgage with special life insurance to protect the home. So listen carefully 14 minutes from now for full details on the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. Tonight's FBI file, The Curious Prospectors. There are those who read their morning papers and shrug their shoulders when they see a story about escaped convicts or a daring crime just because that crime did not happen very close to where they live. What they don't realize, and what your FBI constantly strives to impress upon everyone, is that any crime anywhere in the nation affects you, whether you live next door to the criminal or 3,000 miles away. It affects you because that criminal has attempted to break a law and escape unpunished. And if he should be successful, it would make it that much easier for the next criminal to do the same thing. Crime is an epidemic. And unless every citizen is aware of his stake in the war against it, unless every citizen makes up his mind that this is his war, then progress in combating it will be all but impossible. It takes no great effort to understand what that would mean, what a defeat in fighting the crime wave would do to every institution in the land, every institution and every person, with no exceptions. Tonight's file opens in a general store in a small town in one of our western states. Two men, unshaven and dust-covered, have just entered. The proprietor greets them. Something I can do for you, gents? Yeah. Yeah, we want some help. What kind? Well, we got a map here, and uh, we'd like to find out how to get up into this section. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, up on Tomorrow Hill, eh? That's not what it's marked on the map. No, but we call it Tomorrow Hill because the flowers bloom up there the day before they do any place else. Well, oh. you men strangers around here? Uh-huh. Just got into town. We're not going to be staying very long. Now, look. This map don't show any road up to that place. The map's right. You see, this line goes halfway up. Mm-hmm. Well, that's as far as the road goes. From that roadhead, it's about uh, six miles to where you got marked. How do we get up there? Horses. If you're going hunting, I suggest this spot uh, over here. Get more We're not quail. going hunting, mister. We're looking for gold. 
Oh. We'll need some supplies and horses. You'll need a guide if you're a stranger. We don't need no guide. All we want is for you to tell us the way. Well, when do you figure on going up there? Today. Well, if you can wait, I'd advise it. Why? There's a bad brush fire on the other side of Tomorrow Hill. They're just about getting it under control. We'll take our chances. Okay. Uh, how long you figure on staying up there? Why? Just want to make sure you take along enough supplies. Oh, fix us up about ten days' worth. <laughs> you figure on finding that gold real quick? Maybe we will. Well, you fellas run along and come back here in an hour. I'll have your packs all made up at that time and on horses. Okay, come on. Let's go get some coffee in that diner. I'm hungry. You're always... Everybody looks for gold. That afternoon in the nearby FBI field office, Special Agent Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Gene Butler. Jane, have you finished that report on the Wilson case? I just sent it through, Jim. Did you want to see it? No, I was asking because we've got something that just came in that's quite similar. More escaped prisoners? Yes. These three broke out of the Blaineville County Jail a couple of hours ago. <laughs> Probably got out with a nail file. Did you ever see that prison? No, but I was about to when this message came through. We had a detainer on all three of them. Wow. One of them had already been rap apprehended, a man named Williams. He was found on the outskirts of Blaineville with a bad bullet wound. Where is he now? He's in the hospital. He's unconscious, but alive. Before he passed out, he said that the other two men who escaped with him, Pete Shelby and a stubby Lucas, double-crossed him. That doesn't sound logical, Jim. Why would they work an escape with him and then shoot him? Oh, I checked on that. Williams and Lucas committed a payroll robbery together. A few days after the robbery, they were apprehended and convicted. Yes? But the loot from the job was never recovered. Williams claims that they were on their way to get it. Oh. He says he drew a map of the area where the money is buried. When he finished the map... Selby shot him and took the map. Was Williams able to tell where they were headed? Yes, he said they were going first to a town called Hamilton. Uh, that's one I never heard of. I looked it up. It's a little place in the foothills of the mountains. They're not going to be easy to find if they're headed up into those mountains, Jim. Yeah, I know. Well, I think the first thing to do is check with the Hamilton police, find out if either Shelby or Lucas has been around town. You want me to put the request through? Yes, will you, Gene? I'll go down to the file room and check through the records. <laughs> Pete. What? Let's, uh, take it easy, huh? Look, I don't like riding these horses any better than you do. Easy, baby. Oh. Easy. The sooner we get there, the sooner we get out. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. How come you and William Stash should go way up here anyway? They chased us up here. We knew we were going to get caught, so we buried it. Oh. I wonder how he is. Williams? Yeah. He should be dead. I still don't know why you shot him. I told you. To make it a two-way cut. Just don't try to make it a one-way, Pete. There wouldn't be no point in that. Whoa, whoa. Easy, baby. Easy. You're the only guy who knows where the dough is buried. I mean after we get the dough. Well, let's get the dough first, huh? Hey, do you smell that? What? Something burning. No. Well, I do. The guy in the store that said there was a fire up here, didn't he? Ah, he said it was way over on the other side of the mountain. It could be coming this way. Well, stop worrying about everything, will you? Maybe it's good for me. Maybe if Williams had worried, he'd be here now. I'm going to keep on worrying till I'm out of here with that dough. Gene, I just got a call from the marshal at Hamilton. Shelby and Lucas put in an appearance up there right on schedule. Did he make the arrest? No, but the time he checked, they'd been there and gone. Oh. I've been studying a map of that section, Jim, just in case we had to go up there. Brother, that's a rugged country. Yeah, I know. They're going to be tough to flush out. Oh, the marshal said they went into a general store and asked for directions to a place called Tomorrow Hill. Let's see that map of yours, huh? Okay, here. Yeah. Uh, let's see from the marshal's description. It should be about... Yeah, right here. See? Uh-huh. The forest is thick through there. Yeah, we've got one break, though. At least we know how they're going up the mountain. 
Why? Is there only one trail? No, but the marshal told me that the man in the general store marked their map for them, and he told the marshal which route he marked. Well, that's a break. I also asked the marshal whether there was any chance of heading them off. He said there was. How? Well, there's a clearing up near the top of Tomorrow Hill, and we can land up there with an auto gyro. Then work our way down the trail and meet them coming up. That's it. Well, come on. We can't catch them staying here. Let's get to Hamilton. <laughs> Marshal, how soon should that auto gyro be here? Oh, any time now. It's on its way over from Suttertown. You use gyros much up here? No, I don't, but the Forest Service does when it's fighting a fire. As a matter of fact, that's where that gyro's coming from. Oh, that's right. We heard about that brush fire just before we left. It's better than a brush fire now. It's spread considerably. It must be mean babies when they get out of control. They're always out of control, Jim. Right until the last spark is out. What do you think the chances are of getting in and out of that hill are, Marshal? Well, there's pretty good fire break on top, and unless they get a bad wind and a crown fire, you should be safe enough. A crown fire? Yeah, that's when the fire spreads on treetops without ever touching the ground. Oh, I see. Oh, say, by the way, which one of you is going in, you or your partner? I am. Well, do you know that kind of country? Oh, I worked as a guide one summer while I was in school. Uh, this cabin that we've got marked here on the map, Marshal, uh, this is the place that I'll head for first. Yes, they might stop there. It's the only cabin in the whole hill. Well, if they don't, I'll just start working my way on down. Okay. As soon as you find them, we'll send the gyro back up to take all of you out. Oh, swell. Oh, here it comes. Here comes the gyro. I'll get you that portable transmitter you want. Fine, I can use it. Oh, in fact, I'll call you on it as soon as I reach the cabin. Right. Uh, Marshal? Yes? If you get a chance to talk to that weatherman, will you tell him to turn that fire around the other way? Hey, Stubby. Yeah? Do you remember any of this? Does it look like anything you've seen before? No. What'd you do, come up here blindfolded? All I remember is trees. Ah, that's a help. According to this map, we should be right by the cabin. Well, we better be. It's really getting smoky around here. The fire's getting closer, Pete. Look, forget about the fire. We got more important things. Hey. Hey, look. What? There's a cabin in through them trees. Yeah. Does it look like the place where you stashed the dough? Uh-huh. It is the place. Come on. Come on, let's go. Come, baby. Come on. Yeah. Come on. What a break, Humpy. Huh, yeah. I never thought we'd find it this easy. Where? Where's the stuff buried? Inside the cabin. You remember exactly where? Sure. Okay. Uh, let's get off here. Whoa. 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 <laughs> <sighs> Well, it looks like we got here just in time. Why, what do you mean? Well, the smoke's really moving in. Oh, uh, we won't be here long enough to have trouble with that. Here we are. Come on. Okay. Now, where's the stuff? It's in a tin box under that floorboard. All we need is a Put your hands up, Mr. Huh? Do as I say. Go on, get them up. That's better. What is this? A stick-up? No. Special agent of the FBI. Where'd you come from? Never mind that. Just stand still. I ain't carrying a gun. Oh, but your friend is. This should prove to be the weapon that was used to shoot Williams. They found Williams? Yes. Still alive. That's how you got here, huh? That's right. Now, you two just stand where you are while I arrange some transportation. Station X-47 to X-193... Station X-47 to X-193. Come in, X-47. Gene? Yes, Jim? I've got Shelby and Lucas up here at the cabin. You can send the gyro back. Jim, your zone is ceiling zero. Huh? There's no chance of a gyro coming in for you. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI protects American citizens in American homes. Now a word about another type of home protection. Protection against mortgage foreclosure. A plan that has made it possible for thousands of homeowners to phone their wives like this. Darling, listen to this. We don't need to worry how we're going to meet those doctor bills and our mortgage payments, both coming due next week. We can use the cash fund 
in our Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan. And that's exactly why the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan provides this cash fund. It's a nest egg to use when sickness or unemployment threaten home security. You see, this money-saving, home-saving Equitable Plan combines a low-cost purse mortgage with special life insurance protection. Thanks to the life insurance element, the special cash fund is built up. It's always ready for use in emergencies. As the mortgage shrinks, this cash fund increases. For example, it can be used to pay off a 20-year mortgage in approximately 15 years. In addition, the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan protects the home against the death of the breadwinner. In the Assured Home Ownership Plan, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid under the plan to reduce the principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Last but not least... The mortgage interest is only 4%, and there's a liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. So all in all, a man is very fortunate if his health, age, income, home, and its location qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. The way to find out if you qualify is to get in touch with your equitable society representative. Look in the phone book, or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to tonight's file, The Curious Prospectors. Of all the words in any language, probably the oldest is the word fire, for it goes back to the very beginning of recorded time. Down through the ages, man has come to know something about fire, has come to put it to his own uses in many instances, and yet has also come to realize that there are times when fire is his master. Today, any good student of forestry can show you black marks in the woods that point to a gigantic fire that burned as long ago as the year 1400, even before the discovery of the continent. And yet, despite all that experience in fighting fires, despite the experience of generation after generation, man today still tastes defeat in his battle against a blazing forest. No one can tell which way the wind will turn, which way the fire will jump, which flame will leap the highest, because every fire is a brand new adventure. Every fire makes its own rules. And thus... This battle of man against the fire is the most primitive warfare of all and pits man against an opponent he has never conquered yet, an opponent called nature. Tonight's file continues at the cabin on Tomorrow Hill. Jim, did you hear my report on the gyro that it can't come in? Yes, Gene, but I don't understand it. Visibility was fine when I landed here less than an hour ago. I know it was, but there was a down canyon wind at the other side of the hill then. It shifted, and that clearing you landed in is covered with smoke from the fire. Oh, I see. You'll just have to make it out the best way you can, Jim. Well, Shelby and Lucas have a couple of horses. I can use one and put both of them on the other one. That cabin is six and a half miles from the nearest roadhead, so we'll drive up as far as we can and wait for you. Okay. We'll start immediately. I'll take that trail that Shelby and Lucas used. That's closed off by now, Jim. The only trail open is the one marked number 3838 on your map. Just a minute, Gene. Yeah. Yeah, I got it, Gene. Okay. I'll take 38 all the way down. We're leaving here now. All right, you two. Come on, we've got to get moving. What about the money? I dug it up before you arrived. All right, come on, let's get out of the horses. You think we'll make it? You know as much as I do. Come on, Shelby, start moving. Okay. Now we're going to have to follow... Hey, the look. Center. What? The horses. They're gone. Any news, Gene? Yes, Marshal, and most of it's bad. What happened? Jim called. He surprised both Shelby and Lucas in the cabin. Trouble? Not with them, but the clearing closed in and the gyro couldn't go back and pick them up. Jim was going to come down trail 38 on the two horses Shelby and Lucas used going up. Well, that's not a bad trail. They haven't got the horses. Jim called back and said they'd run away. Hey, this is bad, Gene. 
that fire starts jumping, they might not be able to use 38 for the last two miles. Is there any other way down to the roadhead? No, no trail, but if Jim uses his compass, he might be able to beat the fire. You don't sound very optimistic. Well, there's a weatherman over at the Forest Service, Gene, and by his figures, the wind that's driving the fire down Tomorrow Hill is going to get stronger. If it does, they might not have time to get out of there on foot. That part of the forest is thick with Douglas firs, and they're all dry. Is there any chance at all of getting in there any place with a gyro? No, not a prayer. There's a blanket of smoke over the ridge now, so thick you can't see the sun through it. Is the road still open? It was when I left the Forest Service, but that won't get us within five miles of Taylor. Well, let's drive up there and get as close as we possibly can. <coughs> this stuff is thick. I can hardly walk. Watch your step going through there. You think we'll get out? Sure we will. Look at that smoke. Well, the smoke's getting heavier, Shelby, but it's not getting any hotter. That probably means the fire isn't getting any closer to us. Keep going. We can, we can make it if we just keep up this pace. You, you know where we are? Approximately. Keep going, will you? We've still got over two miles to go to that roadhead. We just keep right on this point on the compass. Oh! oh. What is it? Ah, get up, Stubby. Come on. I can't. What's the matter, Lucas? My ankle. I turned it good. Come on, let's leave him. No. You stay where you are, Shelby. Uh... Come on, Lucas. What are we going to oh, do? Look at it here. We're going to give him a hand. Huh? Yeah, now, come on. Grab his right arm. I'll take his left. We'll never get out of here with him. Take that other arm and left. Uh, come on. Uh, there you go, Come on. How does it feel? I can't stand on it. Now, let's throw one arm around Shelby's shoulder. That's it. I'll put your other arm around mine. All right. <coughs> there. All right, come on. Well, this is where they're setting up the new fire line, Gene. Can't get any closer than this. What do they want with a tractor way up here? Well, they can clear a fire line ten times as fast with a tractor as they can with men alone. Those cats dig in. I see. Look at that tree flare up out there. That flame must have shot up 50 feet. Well, let's hope we don't see a crown fire. If we do, you'll really see some high flames. Is there much danger of one? There's always danger of a crown fire. Oh, with these fir trees. I... Well, I hope they don't have to light those back fires. What do you mean? When they build a fire line like this, they light this end and try to make it burn back and meet the oncoming fire. That way it burns itself out because it's got no place to go. But Jim is in there with his two prisoners. Well, they're not going to light the back fire unless they absolutely have to. But if the flame gets past this line, you know, it'll probably go right through the whole town of Hamilton. Ah. Oh. Look at that crown fire. Look at it go. Gene, that's right across the line that Taylor was coming down. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm afraid so. And I'm also afraid the trail is closed off. That probably means they can't get through. <laughs> that fire's right behind us. Save your breath. We're gonna need it. Come on, Lucas, come on. See if you can get up again, will you? I'll try. Come on. Get him out. Look, let's run for we it. We can't leave him here. He'll be burned to death. What do I care about him? I'm worrying about myself. I'm going back up the hill. There isn't a chance up that way. I'm going to try it. Come back here, you fool. You'll never get through. Yes, I will. Tell me, come back here. That's... Help me up, will you? Yeah, come on. Oh. Give me a hand. Oh. <laughs> Why didn't you shoot him? I threw my bullets away. Back up the trail. Live ammunition isn't safe to carry in a fire. Anyway, he won't go far. Come on. Come on. Put your arm on my shoulder. All right, we'll start moving again. But there's a fire all around us. That fire in front just started. Maybe it's still got some holes in it. Come on. We can't walk right into the fire. I'm not walking into it. I'm looking for something. I think I see it. What? That black spot in there, beyond the flames. It's been burned already. If we can get there, we've got a chance. Hang on. Come on, let's go. Okay. Get down on the ground. Get down. Slap those sparks out. I can't breathe. Get down as close to the ground as you can. There's a little air under the smoke. It's hot. Well, let's hide around those flames. Can't make Stop it. Stop talking, will you? If we get lucky, we've got a chance to live.
Lucas. Hmm? What? Take a deep breath. Hmm? That's cool air. Yeah. You stand up now. Let me try it. Well, yeah, just about. All right, come on. It's a big burned out patch further down. But there's still a lot of... Little fires down there. Maybe they'll make a big fire again. And things only burn once, Lucas. Come on. This is our only chance. Be careful with that ankle. I haven't got the strength to carry you again. Okay. I'll do my best. Wait a minute. Hold it. I thought I heard something. It's Gene. Gene! Gene, up here! Here, Gene! Up here! Stay there! We're safe, huh? Yeah. Lucas, I don't know why we're here, but I'll tell you one thing. I'm sure glad I remembered how to pray. Stubby Lucas was returned to prison and served out the remainder of his sentence. With the finding of the body of Pete Shelby, this case from the files of your FBI was closed. But there is more to this evening's case than the moral that crime does not pay. Further investigation by the Forest Service showed that this fire began when an unthinking camper neglected to put his fire out. The terrible toll taken by fire in this country last year reached the staggering sum of $700 million in money and the irreplaceable total of 11,000 lives. There's a fire started in the United States every 20 seconds throughout the day and night. And the indicting fact is that more than 85% of those fires are started because of one thing, carelessness. This is the beginning of the outdoor season throughout the nation. Some of you soon will be starting on camping trips, on picnics, or on vacation jaunts that will take you outdoors. To you, we address this message. 100% of the fires started because of carelessness could have been prevented. Be careful with lighted cigarettes. Don't leave picnic fires unattended. Use fires if you wish, but never forget that while fire can be an important friend, while it can keep you warm and help supply you with a hot meal, it is also a treacherous enemy, and it can be deadly. Friends, if you were impressed a few minutes ago by what I told you about the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, if the idea appeals to you of a low interest rate first mortgage combined with life insurance to protect your home against death and hard times, then I suggest that you get in touch with your Equitable representative soon. He'll show you exactly what this plan will do for you personally, how much money it can save you, how much added security it will give you. So contact your Equitable Society representative without delay or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a story concerning America's number one crime problem. Its subject, juvenile delinquency. Its title... Little Tough Guy. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society 
will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Little Tough Guy on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Attention all homeowners. Please have pencil and paper handy to make notes. In about 13 minutes, the Equitable Society will give full information on its assured home ownership plan. This Equitable plan is a money saver, a worry saver, a home saver. One of the finest services ever offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. So be ready with a pencil, for you'll surely want to jot down the address for getting further information on the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan. Tonight's FBI file, The Unhappy Medium. There is no telling how much money is mulcted from the general public throughout the year. But it is safe to say that the figure is well over a million dollars a week. That is a stunning fact. And as if to make the situation worse... It is an accompanying fact that, for the most part, the victims chosen by the swindlers are those who can least afford the loss. They prey on the old, the weak, the confused, and they ransack as completely as any set of victorious Nazis looted the shops and homes of conquered countries. There is no geographical center for swindlers because they are, by reason of their business, nomadic people. They wander, they stop, they swindle, and then they wander again. Their base of operations is in their unusually facile minds, and their swindles range from the ludicrous to the brilliant, but whatever their plan of attack might be, they always have a common cause, to get your money. Tonight's file opens in the large living room of a house located in a western city. A stern-faced woman sits on one of the many wooden camp stools scattered around the room. The door opens, and her husband enters. Where have you been? Working. With a racing form in your pocket? I just bought it on the way home. Did you put that ad in the paper? Sure, it's on the streets already. What'd you say in it? Yeah, got a copy of it right here. Yeah, let me see it. Sure. Lays out nice, huh? Mm. Madame Roberto, reader and advisor. Are you in trouble or doubt, worried about business, love, health, or family affairs, or anything pertaining to the welfare of your life? How do you like that pertaining no to? No matter <laughs> what Class, your problems huh? may be, I can help you. Call and consult me for reliable advice. Well, is that it? It's not bad. Where is, uh, Madame Roberto? I'm in here trying on the new costume. Oh. Hey, Elsie, do you want to fix the top hook? I can't reach it. And turn around. <sighs> How's it look? Very good. Let's put the turban on, see how the whole thing looks. Oh, wait a minute. Don't put that turban on yet. The earphone's gone underneath. Oh, yeah. Al, would you move the crystal ball closer to the closet? The other night, the wire was so tight, I couldn't turn my head. I wouldn't mention the other night if I were you. Elsie, it wasn't my fault if the earphones went out of order and I couldn't hear you. Besides, why didn't Al cue me when the phones went out? How did I know they weren't working? She's got the mic in that closet and you've got the phones on your head. I can't hear anybody but myself. That must be pretty dull. Very funny. Elsie, when are we going to leave this town? Leave? Well, we just barely got here. You've been promising me we'd go to Hollywood. Oh, stop with that Hollywood all the time. But what about my career? How am I ever going to get to be a star if I don't get to Hollywood? Look, Peggy, we can't quit here. I got 12 prospects lined up. Maybe we get some new ones from this ad. You got anything on the prospect? Yeah. Here's all the dope I could get on them. Hey, do I have to remember all of that? No, Elsie will have it in the closet. You just listen. Come on, we better start rehearsing this stuff. Well, when are they coming? Post time is 8.30 tonight. It'll be a semi-private meeting like the last one. Now put on those earphones. Let's get to work. (laughs) 
now, Madame Roberto. I have here on these sheets of paper the questions that are most bothersome to these people. Tear them up, please, and throw them away. Yes, madam. Now, through the power she alone possesses, Madame Roberta will peer into the mysterious crystal ball and answer your questions. I am studying, but it is difficult. Keep talking, kid. I hear voices, but they are far away. Some of you people are not holding hands in a chain the way the madam instructed you. I'm going over the questions. Ah, they're all stiff so far. I must have help from you if you want me to answer your problems. Here's a good one. Mrs. H.L. I see some letters forming. They are spelling out Mrs. H.L. That's me. Has the madam any message for Mrs. H.L.? Have her stay after the meeting. I have a message for Mrs. H.L. Will Mrs. H.L. please come up to the front of the room? Oh, yes, surely. Uh -huh. She's ready to be taken. Hook her good. I am Mrs. H.L. What is your message, Madam Roberto? I... I cannot reveal it here. It is too personal. Oh. Please remain after the others have gone. Oh, thank you, madam. Bless you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, take the hand of the person seated next to you and form the chain again. Madam Roberto, do you have any further messages? Peggy, brush the rest of them off fast. Let's get to work on the sucker. <laughs> Meanwhile, in that same city, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is walking over to the desk of Agent Stan Kimball. Hello, Stan. Hi, Jim. When did you get into town? About 15 minutes ago. Oh, I didn't know you were being transferred out here. Oh, I haven't been. I've been chasing and just missing three swindlers for a couple of months now. Every time I close in on them, I find they've just left town. <laughs> I know the feeling. But don't look so discouraged. You'll catch up to them. We'll catch up to them, you mean. Huh? Yeah, your agent in charge just assigned you to work with me. Well, how about filling me in on the background? Okay. Well, this little trio was wanted in five states for larceny, conspiracy to defraud, illegal fortune-telling, and unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. One of them, and Al Watson, he's done time twice. What for? Swindling both times. His wife, Elsie, she was acquitted each time for lack of evidence. Uh-huh. Now, in this new setup they've been using in the last few months, they have a young blonde girl working with them. She uses the name of Peggy Garvey. Ah, and you think they're here, eh? I'm pretty sure they are. The ticket seller at the station in Albuquerque remembered selling them three tickets from there to here. Well, one trouble with trying to find a fortune teller here is that there are a couple of hundred of them spread over the city. Well, we've got pretty good descriptions on them. Stan, let's get an alarm. Maybe the local police can help us tack them down. Where have you been? Out oh, doing some checking up. Well, you've been gone long enough. A thing like this takes time. I found out what I wanted, though. This Mrs. Lincoln has a hefty gob of dough. Good. Let's get back to work, then. We can't keep the old slob waiting too long. Peggy. Yeah? Look, I want you to play this like you're already in Hollywood. And this is your screen test. I will. Now, do you remember everything I told you? I think so. All you gotta do is remember. It's like Hollywood. Okay. I'll be in the next room. Al, you go get Mrs. Lincoln. I'll see you later. Okay, Peggy. All right. Mrs. Lincoln? Yes? Come right this way. Madam Roberta will see you now. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry to have made you wait this long, but Madam Roberta has been concentrating. I understand. Madam Roberta, do you have any message for this troubled person? I am listening to the voices in the air. Queen of the occult, what do those voices tell you? They say that this troubled person has suffered some terrible misfortunes. Oh, that's true, so true. They tell me that there is someone who wishes you great evil. Yes, yes, I know who that is. They say this person person who wishes you great evil has put a hex on you and your possessions. I knew it. Madam Roberto, is there any way in which this troubled one can be delivered from the curse of her hex? I am listening. 
The voices say that if you will bring all your possessions to me, I will be able to deliver you from the hex. Oh, thank you. Thank you. But this must be done within the single turning of the earth. The matter means that if the hex is to be taken off, it must be done by tomorrow at the latest. Yes, I see. The voices say you are to bring to me all of your cash. Because that, too, is Hex. Oh, I will. I have spoken. Mrs. Lincoln, you can go home and sleep tight. By tomorrow night this time, you'll have no more money trouble. Stan, I ran into a little luck. How? The Adams Costume Company here in town sold one of our little trio, a robe and a turban, but the trail ends there. Didn't they get any address at all? No, Mrs. Watson, or whatever name they're using now, came in, picked the stuff up. No alterations, no deposits, no nothing. Well, I hope this isn't another close, but no cigar deal. Well, that isn't all. The police located the taxi driver at the railroad station who picked them up the night they arrived here. Where did he take them? To the Central Hotel, but they're not there anymore. Well, they couldn't work the swindle out of a hotel room. No, my guess is they found a house and rented it. That's always been there, pattern. Jim, let's call on all the fortune tellers alphabetically. Well, I wish we didn't have to take that much time, but I guess that's about the only thing to do. Okay, let's get that list we made up and start calling. <laughs> I'm right here. Oh. Well, what's been happening? The Lincoln Dame came here about an hour ago. She had all the stuff with her. The cash, too? Yes, $7,000 worth of it. Hey. Has she been in there with Peggy for a whole hour? Yeah. What's going on? I don't know. I've been waiting for them to break it up. Stick your head in and give Peggy the sign. I don't want to disturb the deal. Look, she don't know enough to ad-lib this long. Look, but honey... Do as I say, Al. Stick your head in there. Okay. Mrs. Lincoln? Shh, please. Where is Madame Roberto? She went out that other door. She told me to meditate. She said I must have absolute quiet. Oh, sure. You go ahead, Mrs. Lincoln. Keep meditating. Peggy isn't there. What? She left Mrs. Lincoln, went out the back door. She must have gone to her room. Come on, let's check on that. Okay. She should have stayed with a customer. There's something funny about this. What do you mean? Why should she leave the old dame? Well, maybe she ran out of words. Well, let's find out. There's no one in here. Are you sure? Well, do you think I'm blind? Hey, look. What? Wait. Here's a note on the bed. Let's see it. Wait till I read it. Well, well, what does it say? What does it say? She took Mrs. Lincoln 7,000 and went to Hollywood. <laughs> return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI protects American citizens and American homes. Now a word about another type of home protection. Protection to make sure a moving man will never come to your home and say, gee lady, seems like only yesterday we moved you and Mr. Wilson into this swell little house and now I gotta move you out. Pretty tough on you. First you lose a good husband and now you lose your home. Of course it's tough. Nothing tougher. And that's why the Equitable Life Assurance Society created its Assured Home Ownership Plan. This money-saving, home-saving plan combines a low-cost first mortgage with life insurance to give you twofold protection against the two greatest dangers in home mortgages. The first danger is the death of the breadwinner. In the Assured Home Ownership Plan, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage if the owner dies. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid under the plan to reduce the principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. The second hazard in home mortgages is hard times. The Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan protects against that, too. During the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan. It's always ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. As the mortgage shrinks, this cash fund increases. For example, it can be used to pay off a 20-year mortgage in approximately 15 years. Last but not least, the mortgage interest is only 4%, and there's a liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. So all in all, a man is very fortunate if his health, age, income, his home, and its location 
qualify him for an equitable assured home ownership plan. The way to find out if you qualify is to get in touch with your Equitable Society representative. Look in the phone book or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to tonight's file, The Unhappy Medium. It is an axiom among those who do not know the habits or characteristics of criminals that there is honor among thieves. As illustrated by tonight's case from the files of your FBI, nothing could be further from the truth. Thieves, and especially swindlers, recognize no such thing as honor, because to recognize it would be to admit that there is such a thing as a code of ethics, as a set of rules by which human beings were better able to live with each other. The swindler cannot allow himself the luxury of a conscience. And without that, there is no such thing as honor. Any thief would willingly and anxiously steal, lie, cheat, or even murder, no matter who it hurt, so long as he gained from the criminal act. And that is as true of female thieves as it is of men. For the motto of criminals of both sexes is the same. That motto is, he who steals and runs away lives to steal another day. Tonight's file continues as the two FBI special agents get out of their car in front of the swindler's house. This is the place, all right, Stan. Look, they even have a sign on the front lawn. Well, all this occult hokum is perfectly legal in this town. Hope they're still here. Oh, they probably will be. I don't think they suspect we're this close to them. You never know about this trio. They make their score quick and then move on. Hey, look. Front door's open. Yeah. You got the warrant? Yeah. Come on, let's walk in. Well, if they're here, they're being pretty quiet. Well, come on, we better look around. Let's try this room first. Okay. okay. Hold it. Someone's sitting in the chair by the window. Pardon me. Oh, please be quiet. I'm meditating. Oh, I, I see. We're, we're special agents of the FBI. Here are my credentials. What do you want here? Have you seen a man and a woman about 45 and a young blonde girl about 21 or 2? Oh, you mean Professor Williams and Madame Roberto? I think so, yes. Uh, where are they, please? Well, Madame Roberto is in her room. She's concentrating. On what? On removing some evil spirits from my money. Ma'am, I think we'd better start at the beginning and get your whole story. Al, where have you been? I just went back to talk to the hostess. Hmm. You even table hop on planes. I wanted to find out when we get to Hollywood. Sit down. When we get there, you'll know it. Well, there's one good thing about all this. What? Once we get to Hollywood, we shouldn't have too much trouble finding her. How do you figure that? Well, she'll look for a job. Acting. We can nail her that way. <laughs> if you hadn't encouraged that acting, we wouldn't be trying to nail her at all. Are you going to start that again? Well, you're the one who told her she had talent. <laughs> you had her right away to that acting school. That fixed everything. I did it because we needed her. To run off with 7000 Elsie, we'll get the dough back. I'll get it back. And I'm keeping it. From now on, I'm treasurer. Well, don't I get nothing? <laughs> yeah. You meditate. Mrs. Lincoln, when did you first hear of this Madame Roberto? There was an ad in the newspaper. I see. What, uh, what did this ad say? It said that Madame Roberto would help people to solve their problems. Mm -hmm. And you answered it? That's right. Mm. Why are you asking me all of these questions? Because I'm afraid you've been the victim of a group of swindlers. What? Yes, Jim, I... there's yeah. nobody else in the house. I've looked through every room. Do you find anything that might give us a lead? I didn't look for any clues, to tell the truth. I just went from room to room to see if there was anybody around. Oh, I'm sure that you'll find you're mistaken, sir. About there being swindlers, I mean. Uh, Mrs. Lincoln, are those papers in front of you uh, yours? Why, yes. This is the deed to my house. And these are stock certificates I own. And these are my war bonds. Well, why did you bring them here? 
Madame Roberta was freeing them from evil spirits. Uh, Is that all you brought? No. No, I brought $7,000 in cash, which Madame Roberta was removing the hex from also. Uh, How long ago did she start doing that, Mrs. Lincoln? Why, well, she left here about an hour ago to take the money back to her room. She said she could work better there. And uh, she left you here to uh, meditate? That's right. Mrs. Lincoln, it looks like you've been swindled out of your money. Oh, no. We'll try to get it back for you. Stan, I think the first thing to do is start searching this place. See if we can find any lead on where they've gone. <laughs> Well, where have you been now? Down in the lobby. What were you doing down there? Did you think Peggy was going to come over and meet you? We'll find her. We'd better. If we don't, this hotel don't get paid. Look, I know just what to do. This doll wants to be an actress, right? Right. Okay, then. She's got to sign with this central casting place or with an agent if she wants a job. Mm Mm-hmm. And if she's not there, we'll check on some of those hotels for actresses. She'd be likely to live in one of them places. Well, why don't you get on the phone and call up? I did. Any luck? No, but I don't think she'd be stupid enough to use her own name. Yeah, that's true. Well, what are you going to do then? Go to every place in person? We'll have to. We'll make up a list of places to check. We'll each take half. Come on. She must have had her bags packed by the time Mrs. Lincoln arrived. Sure looks that way. What's this? Hey, here's a note that was on the floor. Hmm? What's it say? Dear Elsie and Al, I'm sorry to do this to both of you, but I have taken Mrs. Lincoln's money for myself. I know you will both be mad, but my career comes first. I'm off to Hollywood. (laughs) Sounds like a double cross. Yeah. This can only mean one thing. If she's... Going to Hollywood for a career stand, she must want to be an actress. Yeah. Look, the wastebasket's pretty full. Let's see if we can find anything else in here, huh? Uh, just dump it down the bed. Oh, that's right. yeah. oh. <laughs> Looks like correspondence of some sort here, Jim. Huh? Well, just circulars, though. Here's a batch of envelopes. Oh, wait a minute. These are addressed to the girl. Peggy Garvey? Yeah. Stan, look at these addresses. Albuquerque comes first. I'm off to Hollywood. (laughs) Sounds like a double cross. Yeah. This can only mean one thing. If she's gone to Hollywood for a career stand, she must want to be an actress. Yeah. Look, the wastebasket's pretty full. Let's see if we can find anything else in here, huh? Uh, Just dump it down the bed. Oh, that's right. Oh. Looks like correspondence of some sort here, Jim. Just circulars, though. Here's a batch of... Empty. She must have had her bags packed by the time Mrs. Lincoln arrived. Sure looks that way. What's this? Hey, here's a note that was on the floor. Hmm? What's it say? Dear Elsie and Al, I'm sorry to do this to both of you, but I have taken Mrs. Lincoln's money for myself. I know you will both be mad, but my career comes first. I'm off to Hollywood. <laughs> Sounds like a double cross. Yeah. This can only mean one thing. If she's going to Hollywood for a career stand, she must want to be an actress. Yeah. Look, the wastebasket's pretty full. Let's see if we can find anything else in here, huh? Uh, just dump it down the bed. Oh, that's right. yeah. oh. <laughs> Looks like correspondence of some sort here, Jim. Huh? Well, just circulars, though. Hey, here's a note that was on the floor. Hmm? What's it say? Dear Elsie and Al, I'm sorry to do this to both of you, but I have taken Mrs. Lincoln's money for myself. I know you will both be mad, but my career comes first. I'm off to Hollywood. (laughs) Sounds like a double cross. Yeah. This can only mean one thing. If she's gone to Hollywood for a career stand, she must want to be an actress. Yeah. Look, the wastebasket's pretty full. Let's see if we can find anything else in here, huh? Uh, Just dump it down the bed. Oh, that's right. Oh. Looks like correspondence of some sort here, Jim. Just circulars, though. Here's a batch of envelopes. Wait a minute. These are addressed to the girl. Peggy Garvey? Yeah. Stan, look at these addresses. Albuquerque, Denver, Kansas City. Hey, these are all the places they've been before. Places where I've just missed them. Uh, anything in the envelopes? Um, no. No, but they're all from the same outfit, the International School of Dramatic Art. There's one, two, seven envelopes. 
Let's look in the other rooms, Jim. Maybe we can find a better lead there. Oh, uh, wait, Stan. I don't know if we need a better lead. Let's find a phone. I've got an idea. Well, where have you been this time? I'm sorry, honey. I thought you said meet you on the other corner. I said in front of the drugstore. Well, come on. You told me it never rains in California. You want me to put in a fix with the weather? I want you to take me to Peggy. Where'd you find her? Where does she live? Right in that apartment house. Mm, I didn't even have enough money to buy an umbrella. You'll have enough in a couple of minutes. Look, are you taking bows? It took you two weeks to find her. This is a big place, you know. Here, this is the joint. Go ahead. You know what apartment she lives in? Yeah, right here on the ground floor, 117. Down this way. 11, 13. Here it is, 117. Just a minute. Out of the way, you little crook. Elsie! Out of the way. Didn't think we'd find you, huh? Al, we didn't come here for conversation. We want our money. Come on, Peggy, get it up. I don't know to what you are referring. Huh? I said, I don't know to what you are referring. Look, whatever you're eating, swallow it. We can't understand you. That's diction. Diction? We don't care what you call it. Just come up with that 7,000. I don't know what you... The 7,000 you took from old lady Lincoln. Now, where is it? I'm using it. I need it for my career. Al, case those dresser drawers. Okay. Get away from them drawers. (laughs) Let's shift the diction out of her. Hey, look, keep away from there. That's my money, and hey, I... here it is, right on top. Look, looks like most of it's here, too. Hey, don't you touch that money. Don't bother counting it. We'll do that back at the hotel. Let's get out of here. Okay. Hey, wait, you can't leave me with any... Step back inside. Uh, Come on, both of you. Who are you, mister? I'm a special agent of the FBI. I've got warrants here for the arrest of all three of you. you got nothing on us. My guess is we've got enough for you to serve long terms in a federal penitentiary. Well, honey, <laughs> now you'll know where I've been. Watson and his wife, Elsie, were tried, convicted, and sentenced to 15 years in prison for violation of the National Stolen Property Act. Their young confederate, Peggy Garvey, was given a five-year sentence and then placed on probation. And thus, your FBI ended the careers of three greedy swindlers. The clue which led the two special agents to the apartment in Hollywood came from the International School of Dramatic Art. Special Agent Taylor reasoned that since the young blonde had gone to the trouble of notifying the school of her previous changes of address, she might do the same thing again. Within a week, the school received the change of address and notified the local FBI field office, which relayed the information. And so, once again, it was not a brilliant stroke of inspiration which closed a file successfully for your FBI, because those inspirations come far apart, and the reputation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation is too solid to have been based on hunches. It was hard work which closed this case. Hard work in searching diligently and then following every clue to the logical conclusion. A conclusion which ultimately led to the stamping of a word across this particular file. The single important word, convicted. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. Friends, if you were impressed a few minutes ago by what I told you about the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, if the idea appeals to you of a low-interest-rate first mortgage combined with life insurance to protect your home against death and hard times, then I suggest that you get in touch with your Equitable representative. He'll show you exactly what this plan will do for you personally, how much money it can save you, how much added security it will give you. So contact your Equitable Society representative without delay or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, an unusual story revealing the cunning tactics of an elusive murderer. Its subject, extortion. Its title, student of violence. 
The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Student of Violence on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.